Welcome back to our third and final panel of the day as we examine the younger generation born after 1980. This one is the panel most appropriate, I guess, for the city in which we meet, Washington, because it's about how young people perceive politics and government, what their views are on the issues of the day, and how they choose to engage in political life or not. When I traveled around the United States in the midterm election year 2006, and again this year, looking to see how the, the younger generation was being affected by the recession, and I, when I say this year, I'm really talking about last 2009, I found some strong views, I found a surprising confidence, and even a bit of wisdom. Here's a minute's worth of what we found. We have to be wiser with our decisions than uh, and how we handle things with the economy, with uh, energy, than, uh, few, than previous generations have. We grew up with things like Will and Grace right. and you know having that in the comfort of our home. And so we've grown up with it and it's you been a part up. of our lives. And it's not groundbreaking in the least bit to have boring interracial couples. Our generation seriously thinks that no matter what comes to you, there's, a, uh, there's a, an answer to your problem. That's right, an answer to your problem, and you can find it right here in Washington, D.C. <laughs> well, with us is yet another excellent panel of individuals uniquely qualified to talk about our topic, all of whom I am sure are going to have those answers. Let's meet them, starting with Matt Bai, and I'm going to ask them to come up and take a seat as I introduce them. Matt is the contributing politics writer for the New York Times Magazine, where he covered both the 2004 and the 2008 presidential campaigns. He has done much commented upon cover stories, including on President Obama's health care strategy. And he has written often about issues of generational change in American politics and society. His book, The Argument, was about the rise of the first Internet age political movement. Eli Pariser founded a website in the aftermath of the September 11th terror attacks, and then at the ripe age of 20, he helped to oversee its merger with the progressive organization MoveOn.org, which the New York Times Magazine called the mainstream arm of the peace movement. He led MoveOn to become the first place where large numbers of small donations could be mobilized through online engagement. He is now president of MoveOn's board. Rehan Salam, Rehan, where are you? Come on up is a fellow and a policy advisor for the New America Foundation and the author of the much acclaimed 2008 book titled Grand New Party, How Conservatives Can Win the Working Class and Save the American Dream. Rehan writes about politics, about culture, and about technology. He's a columnist for Forbes.com and for the Daily Beast. And from Pew are two panelists who will be making the presentation of their survey findings. First, Michael Dimmock. Where are you, Mike? Come on up. Associate Director for Research at the Pew Research Center. He is principally responsible for the development of the center's research projects, including questionnaire design and data analysis. He has published multiple articles on public opinion, voting behavior, and survey methodology. And Scott Keeter, a Director of Survey Research here at the Pew Research Center and co-author of four books, including... A new engagement, question mark, political participation, civic life, and the changing American citizen, which included special focus on the younger generation compared to its elders. Scott has also written on political communications and behavior, and since 1980, he's been an election night analyst of exit polls for NBC News. Now, after Scott and Michael finish, uh, the panel will talk, uh, again, same pattern. We're going to talk for about 45 minutes, just the panel, and then we're going to turn to you in the audience. Scott Keeter, you are on first. Thank you, Judy, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, first, I'm going to start with something that isn't news, and that is that the millennials made a big splash in 2008. Everybody knows that. Um, according to the exit polls, uh, the level of support for the Democratic candidate by uh, young people was relative to the votes of everybody else was greater. That disparity was greater in 2008 than it has ever been in the history of exit polling. Um, Sixty-six percent of the millennial generation voted for Barack Obama in 2008 versus 
uh, only about 53 percent of the uh, of the voting public overall. And as you can see in the right-hand pair of bars, that difference there is quite large compared uh, with, with other years. But even before 2008, the millennials were looking like a very strong Democratic uh, constituency. Fifty-four percent of them voted for John Kerry in 2004. That was his best age group. And 60 percent of them voted for Democratic candidates for Congress um, in the 2006 congressional elections. So one thing that we can take away from this is that while the millennials really like uh, Barack Obama, and they still like him, um, and they voted for him at very high levels, um, their impact on politics over the past several years was not just about Obama. They are not an Obama phenomenon. Their liberalism and democratic leanings predate Obama. Now, aside from how they voted in these elections, Another notable aspect was their level of engagement in terms of voter turnout. Um, the gap between voter turnout um, between younger and older voters has been quite large um, over the past uh, 30 or 40 years. This is um, a couple of pictures, uh, lines showing you voter turnout among people in the 18 to 29 age group and people 30 and older going back to 1972 at the time that 18 to 20 year olds got the uh, got the vote. Um, the gap through this period, uh, at least since about 1980, has been quite sizable, 20 percentage points or more. And there was evidence going up to the 2000 election that this gap was actually getting wider rather than narrower. Uh, there was a, an uptick in voter turnout in the uh, very engaging presidential election of 1992. But after that, you, you really had a very wide gap, uh, reaching 25 points in, in uh, the 2000 election. But uh, in the 2004 election, uh, young people turned out at significantly uh, higher level. The, the, their, their voter turnout overall uh, rose from 40 percentage points to 49 percent. Um, the voter turnout of older people went up a little bit as well but not by nearly as much, with the result that the gap between younger and older people in terms of turnout narrowed to 19 points. And then in the, um, in the 2008 election, the gap narrowed again, it, not as dramatically as the difference between 2000 and 2004, but um, there was some uptick in turnout among young people and maybe even a little bit of a downtick among older people with the result that the gap uh, stood at 16 percentage points in 2008. Well, what is it that it really accounts for this movement of young people towards the Democratic Party through this period, as well as their high level of engagement in politics? Um, as you've heard today, this is a very uh, diverse generation, race, racially and ethnically, um, and that, of course, matters politically because non-whites, as we've heard uh, earlier, are more likely to vote Democratic. Um, and just to give you a sense of how much the, the electorate of young people changed between 2000 and 2008, I have a couple of statistics from the exit polls. Um, in 2008, just 62 percent of young voters were white, 62 percent. 18 percent of them were black, 14 percent were Hispanic, um, and others of, of mixed race or other races. By comparison, eight years earlier, nearly three-quarters of young voters were white. So from 74 percent in 2000 down to 62 percent white uh, in 2008. But even more than race and ethnicity, the millennial generation has uh, very different values in many important uh, politically relevant respects compared with their elders. Before I show you some of the trends that we've documented in these values, let me say a word about how we know what we know about these things. Um, the center has been tracking American political values for over 20 years. Starting in 1987, the Times Mirror Center conducted a series of studies on American political values where we asked upwards of 80 questions in a survey touching on areas such as culture, race, um, government, foreign, military affairs, and the like. We've taken in each of the surveys that we've conducted these questions and we've separated them by subject area and then we've made summary indexes of 
uh, the values in, in like related areas so that we can track uh, movement of attitudes over time using exactly the same methods. And we've done this in order to do uh, such analyses as a comparison of the values of Democrats and Republicans. And so a couple of years ago, we documented how much more polarized American politics had become. The values of Democrats and Republicans had gotten further apart uh, over time. We can do the same thing with generations. Um, because we've asked these questions 14 times since 1987 in exactly the same way, um, we can actually take the generations, not just the age groups, but the people according to their birth cohorts, and we can track them when they first appear in our survey, and then we can follow them over time in, in a process that's, that's called a cohort analysis. Um, that way we can see not only how uh, a particular birth cohort is changing uh, in response to the events of the moment, uh, but then when a new cohort comes in, we can see uh, where they stand on these value questions compared with not only the, their elders at that point in time, but also at um, earlier generations when they were the same ages. So hopefully that um, will become clear when I show you a couple of the, of the charts that we have. Uh, let me start with the area where I think we see the greatest difference between younger and older cohorts, and that's on social, social and cultural values. Here we're talking about questions relating to the acceptance of homosexuality, um, interracial dating, expanded roles uh, for, for women, immigrants, and, and the like. And there are a lot of different questions that can go into this. This particular index has about five items. So here are the trends. The first line that I have up there, this uh, sort of yellowish line, is uh, the silent generation, the oldest of the cohorts that, that we're tracking here. If I put the greatest generation, born even before the silent generation up there, the line would be even higher. Now, on this particular chart, lines that are high on the page will be conservative uh, social values, and as we add more lines, you'll see there's a, a, an increasing liberal trend. So uh, this is the line for the baby boomers. So um, even when we first started, they were already fully established as a, as a birth cohort in our surveys, and they were significantly less conservative than the silent generation. And also, as you can see over time, there hasn't been a lot of change. In other words, the line isn't going up or down particularly, so social values of the sort that we're measuring there have only moved a little bit. They've become a little more liberal, but not uh, a whole lot. This is Generation X. Uh, when they first appear as a full birth cohort in 1994, they too are more um, liberal socially, less conservative socially, and uh, while there are some bumps up and down, they continue to be distinctive from the other two cohorts. That's the millennial generation, the orange line. They are uh, by far uh, the least socially conservative generation, and it looks like that's going to be the pattern that's going to continue if what we've seen in the past um, bears up. In another area, one that's very important uh, politically, um, we have a set of questions that uh, tap attitudes about government, attitudes towards whether government should be doing more, whether uh, government um, is uh, inefficient and wasteful or does a better job than, than, it, than, than we generally think that it does. And on this one, the higher lines are going to be the more liberal positions. So we start out again with the silent generation, and you see that while there have been ups and downs, there's a little dip in the line there about a third of the way through. That's 1994, when everybody was pretty conservative. Uh, that's the baby boom. They started out somewhat more liberal in terms of support for government than the silent generation. Um, but they have really converged with the silent generation over time, with their views uh, coming closer to theirs. That's Generation X, um, even more supportive uh, than the baby boomers, although when they first arrived, it was in the very anti-government uh, uh, sentiment of 1994, and that's the millennial generation. So we don't see enormous differences across the cohorts, but they are pretty consistent, and they've remained uh, fairly distinctive, again, with the exception of um, the uh, uh, baby boomers and the silent generation converging in the last uh, couple of times that we've done these surveys. Now, we've done a lot of these, and I won't take up uh, the time that I think we want to have here for uh, further discussion about the, some of the implications of what we'll present, 
uh, telling you about other value dimensions, but uh, young people do stand out on some other ones, especially on questions relating to equal rights and even affirmative action. Um, you can see that, again, there's the same pattern of the older generations being somewhat more conservative, less supportive <coughs> of uh, equal rights and affirmative action, and the millennials being uh, the most liberal. On some other issues that uh, we've tracked, we don't see particular uh, differences. Uh, for example, attitudes about business uh, are, are not very different across the generations and don't seem to be uh, taking any particular tack. One of the uh, oddest things, I think, from, from our work over the past few years is that even with the terrible recession and the, uh, uh, the, the fury that's been aimed at Wall Street, general attitudes about business in our uh, 2009 survey taken in the teeth of all of this did not show a, a particular uptick in anti-business sentiment. And the same was true for, for the millennials. If I showed you that graphic, uh, the lines would actually just be all, all clustered together. Similarly, we don't see very big differences in, in the, among the generations in attitudes about the social safety net. Um, and so there are some areas in which uh, young people and older people don't differ too much. One final one I'll mention in which we have seen a little bit of a difference uh, actually emerging this uh, past year are, are attitudes about the use of military force. Young people have, uh, have been showing uh, somewhat greater reluctance to use military force. They are, are actually uh, somewhat less satisfied with the way Obama is handling the situation in Afghanistan. They're more opposed to the increase in, um, in uh, troop levels there than other generations. But over time, we haven't seen a lot of differences uh, on this particular set of, of value questions. Now, what we have seen here are some differences that are interesting and certainly politically relevant. And as we can see for some of them, they, these things have persisted. But not everything is immutable. And uh, the past year has been a particularly challenging one for the Democratic Party. For a look at what's happened to uh, the millennial generation and their attachment to the Democrats, I'll hand the clicker over to my colleague, Michael Dimmock. Great. Thanks, Scott. I, I think the, the themes that I'm picking up from the sessions today are that you know, there really are values that millennials hold that set them apart, that there's a characteristic, there's a profile of this generation that's interesting. Um, that is shaped by demography, it's shaped by sort of sociology in, in listening to Neil Howe, it's shaped by the environment that they're arriving into. And the question from a political perspective is how does that play out now and into the future uh, as a voting block? Uh, and we started this conference with Andy and Scott reminding us that they, this is a generation that's already felt a little bit of political power and, a, and, and an influence in recent elections. Can Democrats count on that kind of support from this generation now and into the future? The suggestion from these slides Scott's showing us is that these characteristics in terms of values tend to be sticky. In other words, while the, the mood of the public or the values of the public may ebb and flow towards government over time, the relative distance between generations tends to stay. And so the characteristics of this generation relative to others are likely to be robust. Is that mean that this is a, you know, that, that suggests that this is a generation that ought to be favorable to the Democrats now and into the future if those values differences do persist? But are they going to be able to hold on to two to one margins like they had in 2008 and count on that from this generation as a voting block? Let's use 2008 as a jumping off point, and then I'll talk a little bit about what we're seeing already in terms of what this means. What I'm doing here is I'm taking the data we collected in 2008, and I'm sort of taking a cross-section of the public. So across the bottom in our ridiculously small fonts here, uh, we've laid out the youngest people over on the left and the oldest people over on the right. So I've taken a, a cross-section of the, of the electorate in the year 2008. And the point of this is to show how distinctive the millennials are. The millennials are over on the left, and this is the balance of party identification in all of the polling that we conducted over the course of the year. Uh, among the millennials, 62% either called themselves Democrats. We say, do you consider yourself a Democrat, Republican, or independent? And if you're independent, we say, well, do you lean more towards the Democrats or more towards the Republicans? These are sort of standard metrics, uh, and one of the values is they, they, we can trend them over time. 62% um, of young people either identified or lean Democratic, 30% identify or lean Republican, mirroring, of course, the outcome of the election, a two-to-one 
uh, margin for, for Barack Obama. And you see that's pretty distinctive. You know, the breakpoints aren't exactly along the generational lines that we're using here for analytical purposes, but quite distinctive from the other generations. One of the reasons I start with this kind of unusual cross-sectional approach to thinking about it is it's a way of thinking about what the future might look like. Because basically, as time passes, these generations are going to move to the right along this graph, right? And it, are the young people going to be a pig in the python, so to speak, a big democratic bubble that just persists as they get older into the generation? And it's interesting to look back at some of the older generations in this chart. You can kind of see in the middle of the baby boomers, there's a little hump sort of around the middle of that chart. These are folks in their mid to late 50s right now. Um, that's sort of the folks who really were coming of age in the late Vietnam years and the, in the Watergate era. This is, was a very democratic generation when they first came into the electorate. Gallup polls conducted in 1974 when these folks were in their, 19, were in their 20s and late teens um, showed a 47% to 17% Repub democratic advantage in identification. That's even more overwhelming than what we're seeing right now among millennials not necessarily surprising given the circumstances and the context. You still see some echo of that democratic advantage in this group, but it's certainly more muted than it was in the peak moment of 1974. And the question looking forward, I think, is, is 2008 a kind of peak moment like that, that, that defines a generation, shapes a generation, but is it always going to remain that distinct and that separate from the rest of the population? Let me switch this a little bit to more traditional plot of the balance of party identification in the electorate over the last 10 years. So here we're going from 2000 on the left over to 2008 right now. And this is, in the bold lines, the balance of party identification, including leaners, among millennials. And you see that even when we first start measuring them in 2003, 2004, they're already more democratic than the rest of the public, which is shown with the lighter dashed lines. Um, Apropos to Scott's point, right from the start, they were showing value differences from the rest of the public and were already voting more Democratic in 04 and 06. But that in, by 2008, which I highlighted here, because that's the, the cross, where I took the cross section I just showed you, we see that getting even more extreme. The, the gap between millennials and the rest of the public gets even wider uh, to that 62 to 30 percent margin. Already, as Scott prefaced, 2009 has been a somewhat rougher year for Democrats in terms of their image. You know, Obama's ratings are down from what were potentially particularly high, particular highs at the start of his presidency. What's happened to the balance of party ID over the course of the past year is a convergence, again, a kind of return to where we were in the earlier part of the 2000s. Um, but that the movement, the, the sort of ebbing of democratic fortunes has been particularly notable among the millennials themselves. The proportion of millennials who identify or lean democratic has fallen from 62 percent in 2008 as a whole to 54 percent in the fourth quarter of 2009. To kind of give more texture to this, we've broken 2009 into quarters, because really the democratic losses started to take place in the later part of 2009 as a year. The percent identifying or leaning Republican has already bounced up from 30 percent in 2008 to 40 percent at the fourth quarter of 2009. And the thing to keep in mind behind all of this is that, you know, the values are likely stable. We haven't updated all the values trends every year. But that political events matter, you know, and the environment and the circumstances of 2008 were extreme. You had uh, a change candidate who represented youthfulness and diversity by his very nature. Uh, you had an extremely unpopular incumbent president to younger people who rejected mo many of the things that George W. Bush stood for. Uh, that created an environment that, that was really, you know, a set a, 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 where young people could get mobilized and were very sort of strong in their democratic leaning. The other thing that's important to keep in, in mind behind this is I am tracking in these slides Democrats and Democratic leaners, and I've sort of blurred that distinction, but it's not an irrelevant one. The plurality of young people are independents. When we say, do you think of yourself as a Democrat, Republican, or independent, they're saying independent by very wide margins. Now, that's characteristic of youth. That's not unusual. But Democrats never really closed the deal with young people through this period. Even in 2008, young millennials were no more likely to call themselves Democrats than any other generation. They were just more likely to lean Democratic than other generations. They never really fully pulled into the political party. And the erosion that you're seeing here reflects that sort of lack of firm attachment to the party. 
The counterpoint to that is the Republican Party, even though you're seeing this 10-point rise here, that's mostly a rise, again, in leaning, not people who right out of the gate call themselves Republicans. The Republican Party has had a very difficult time getting traction among this generation. Even in this fourth quarter of 2009, only 24 percent of the millennials think of themselves as Republicans. That's a very low number and hasn't really come up even from 2008. So to the extent that 09 gives us a launching point to think about the future 2010 and beyond, uh, I think is where we can move on.